Good morning, everybody. It's Dr. Galvin with uh, the coronavirus update for the day. Uh, this is my last uh, ER shift in a row. I've worked the last four out of five nights. Uh, been a variety of, uh, it's been a little bit crazy, different nights. Had four um, nights, three very busy nights, and one really, really slow night in the middle of it. So a couple nights I saw 16, 17 patients. And one night I saw six, I don't know why. Um, and that was weird because it was Saturday night, which is usually not a, a quiet night. But uh, whatever, done now, thankfully, gonna be heading home. I did not post yesterday, I apologize, it was Memorial Day, I was just exhausted. I don't know why, you know, sometimes you, have a, a, you sit around doing nothing and those are the nights that you go home most tired. And I was exhausted yesterday, and it was Memorial Day. Um, and I think I'm going to start doing these things a little less frequently because we're kind of at a, at a you know, a steady state here and things are not changing minute to minute. So I think I can probably break things up to every couple days and also start adding in a lot more wellness content because I've gotten tons of messages that that's what people want me to do. Um, and I'm going to try to accommodate that. And I've got somebody who's going to be helping me with the videos and a lot of other stuff uh, in the works. Uh, for those of you just joining us, my name is Jeffrey Galvin. I'm a board certified emergency medicine physician. Uh, I also run a functional medicine clinic outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, but I still work emergency department shifts and I try to give some updates about um, the virus and what's going on. As usual, we usually start with the numbers, 5.5 million cases worldwide so far, um, 346,000 deaths worldwide and 2.2 million cases recovered. Here in the US, we're almost at 1.7 million cases and we are just about to cross 100,000 deaths, which is a horrible threshold. Uh, but, you know, and, and some of the models we looked at, we thought that we would hit 100,000, you know, in the second week of June, and here it is, you know, um, you know May 26th, and we're gonna hit that number. Um, and we've had, I think in the U.S., we've had 350,000 people recover. What I want to talk about this morning is hydroxychloroquine because, boy, we keep coming back to this and I keep getting hammered, especially on YouTube, with these people that for some reason think that there is some conspiracy out there that we don't want to use hydroxychloroquine, that the big pharma wants to come up with something else. Well, if that was the case, I would imagine that there would be something else they would be pushing instead. There is nothing else. The only really viable, you know, possible thing is remdesivir, which is not even available. You can't even get it if you wanted it because it's still an investigational drug. And plus it's only to be used in the sickest people in the hospitals because it's an IV drug. Whereas hydroxychloroquine is an oral drug and could conceivably be used by a lot of people. So why is it that doctors don't want to use it or are afraid to use it? Well, I think to answer that question, we have to understand the nature of studies and what studies can tell us. And a very, very important thing that you have to understand is that observation does not equal causation. And what that means is that you cannot use an observational study to link to causation. And so um, in an observational study is when we go back and we look at a bunch of things and we say, well, there was this association with people that got hydroxychloroquine with maybe they got better faster or maybe they got sicker faster um, than people that didn't. The only way that you can attribute causation is with a randomly controlled trial. And that's because when we look back and we do an observational study, we're not controlling for any other variables. And so there can be many, many different variables going on with people and we, can only, we can't make any attribution to a particular treatment. So when we look back at these observational studies, we don't have any control over any other factors, and we don't know what other things may be affecting the results. The only way you can control that is when you do a randomized controlled study, meaning that you have one group of, of people that are relatively similar, and you divide them up randomly, and some of them get the treatment, and some of them don't. And because the people are relatively similar, the assumption is that most of the other things about them are similar, and the only real difference is this treatment. So a randomly controlled trial would look like, okay, we've got this group of people, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick people that have been diagnosed with COVID-19. 
And in one group, we're gonna randomize them to getting, say, hydroxychloroquine and maybe zinc, or hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, or some combination thereof. And the other group is not going to get that. And we're going to follow the course of their illness, and then we're going to analyze that data. And in that case, we can definitively say, oh, look, the people that got this combination of, of medicines did better or they did worse. What we can't do is we have observational studies. We can only say that there seems to be an association, but that association cannot be proved until a randomized controlled trial can be done. Now, the other rub is that, you know, what's the percentage of people that die of COVID-19? Well, you know, those numbers are a little bit all over the place, but we think that, you know, the, indiv the, uh, the infectious fatality rate is somewhere between one and 1.5% which means that somewhere between you know, 98.5 and 99% of people are going to recover. So I could give people almost anything, right? I could say I'm gonna give them raisins and 98.5 to 99% of people are going to recover. Does that mean that raisins you know, cure COVID? No, it doesn't. And so many of these studies that we're looking at um, are, are not really able to give us information. And, I, and that goes also with the studies that show potential harm. So I think a good example of that is this Lancet study. That was a retrospective observational study of 96,000 patients. And they, they found an association between the patients that got hydroxychloroquine and increased mortality in the hospital. Now, that study cannot say that hydrochloroquine or hydroxychloroquine causes increased mortality. All they can say is there might be an association here. And so what the World Health Organization did was they have a, a couple big studies going on. And what they've done is they've said, pause the studies and analyze the data because they do have randomly controlled trials going on and they have actual that data where some people are getting it, some people aren't. And what they're saying is, there's a potential danger here, we don't know. Let's pause the study, take the data that you have and analyze it and see if there really is risk. If they analyze that data and there's no risk, then the studies continue. If they analyze that data and there is increased deaths, then we actually know that that's true. There's another study that's a pre-print, you know, pre-release study that also shows this improvement in, um, in patients that got hydroxychloroquine and zinc. And I've talked about the fact that I don't think you can use hydroxychloroquine without zinc because of the fact it's an ionophore um, and it helps zinc get across the cell membrane and zinc is a is a inhibitor of viral replicase, but you can use that with quercetin as well. And there's a study that's coming out looking at quercetin and zinc as well. But there was a study out of, I think, NYU, and it's very, very preliminary and shows this um, association between lowered mortality and hydroxychloroquine and zinc. But again, observational study, useless for determining causation. But, you know, we, there's about 200 different studies going on currently with hydroxychloroquine. But as a good physician, you need to have a randomly controlled trial to know for sure, because right now we don't have any proof that it reduces death. We don't have any proof it prophylaxes. We have some association based on randomized, uh, on, on observational studies. And we also have some association with increased mortality related to QT prolongation and some other side effects based on observational studies. Neither one of those on either side of the argument is proven until we get a randomly controlled trial and, and hopefully multiple randomly controlled trials. So, you know, people have said, well, Zeb Zelensky has had all these people. Listen, Zeb Zelensky may be a great doctor, but he has not published a single paper, not published his data. So it's basically his word. And you know what? I'm sorry. I can't, as a physician, risk people's lives based on somebody's word. I need to have real data because that's my mandate is to take the best care possible for my patients. And I don't buy this big pharma argument because if that was the case, there would be an alternative and there is no other alternative. There's not, no big pharma company is, is pitching some drug that supposedly either prevents um, COVID uh, infections or reverses it. Like I said, remdesivir is a, is a special use case. You can't even buy it. It's only being used investigationally. Um, it's not available. It's not available at our hospital. You couldn't get it if you wanted to. Um, and it's only for the most sick people. So there, this idea that somehow it's being suppressed because of 
a big pharma. Well, they don't have anything to, to sell you, so I don't, I don't buy that at all. I think we need to be smart and we need to get real data and that must come from randomly controlled trials because that is the only thing that can show us whether or not what we think is true. And you know what, I get it. A lot of people have, you know, many of you are looking into this and I get it, you've, you've done all this reading and, and you think you know some things, but you know, some of us have been doing this for 25 years and have seen things like this before and also have seen the bad outcomes that can come when decisions about medicines are made before good data is available and people get hurt and people can get killed if these decisions are made incorrectly. So nobody's trying to, to hold back medicine from anybody. What doctors are trying to do is get the right information so we can tell our patients the right things and do the right things so that we can get people feeling better and, and get us through this crisis as efficiently and as safely as possible. Hopefully that's the last I'm gonna talk about hydroxychloroquine until we actually get some data from randomly controlled trials so we can actually have some real answers. Because any of these observational studies can only say there's a possible association. They cannot give us any idea about causation. And so when you're looking at these, these papers, remember, reporters want headlines. And so the headlines are gonna say one thing. It's up to you to do your own research and to look at it yourselves. And if you look up that study and it says observational, then you know it cannot give you any conclusion about it. All it can do is draw a possible association. It cannot draw causation. If it says a randomly controlled trial and it comes to a conclusion, then if the study design is good, then you can say, yes, this actually means what the study says. But reporters like headlines and they, they tend to twist these studies and the wording of these studies and it's incorrect. So do your own research, do your own fact checking. Like I always say, don't believe me, do your own work, but I'm trying to explain to you how to best interpret these studies and understand that observational studies are not able to tell us whether or not something is true or not. As usual, if you find these videos useful, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us and follow us on Facebook. We are gonna be doing a lot more wellness content. We're gonna be talking about nutrition, fitness, sleep, stress, hormones. I'll talk a little bit about my re-journey back into health. I told you I kind of got off the bandwagon uh, and have gotten kind of tightly back on things in the last couple of weeks, feeling much better and, and you know, getting back into my workout routine and nutrition routine. Um, going to be doing some cooking videos as well because we talk about functional nutrition a lot and, you know, you don't have to eat, you can eat really great food and eat healthy. You don't have to eat sticks and rocks and, and lousy, un tasty stuff and we're going to be doing some some uh, food related videos as well um, as usual wash your hands take care of yourselves take care of your families take care of each other and I will see you soon good night